All right. So tonight, John Tisdale is one of our members. He's going to be turning a wheat plot for us and showing us fair curve is what you're doing. All right. So I'm going to turn that over to John and let him take it through the rest of the night for us. John? Am I being heard? I think I am. Okay, well, uh, this is the second demonstration I did. I did earlier uh, this month. I was up in Denton. And uh, so y'all are the second set of guinea pigs. The, uh, and I'm looking out on this particular group, and there's an awful lot of people here that have forgotten more than I'll ever know. Uh, as you know, I've, I've turned large turnings for some time. I, I bring them up here occasionally. And uh, uh, one of the problems is, is when it came to doing a gift, when doing something for somebody, doing something for a neighbor, whatever, I had nothing to, to, to give. In fact, uh, all of my, we don't have any of, our, any of my pieces in our house. They all go to galleries and things like that. So, uh, I developed the uh, capability of doing weed pots, which is what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, as a general rule, are we, are we connected? Okay. I've, I've, just like y'all, I've, I've sat through a lot of demonstrations. And there's kind of, uh, there's two kinds of demonstrators. There's guys that will come up and absolutely dazzle you, and we've all seen those guys, you know, with a high degree of expertise, and they, boy, they go zipping through something and produce a masterpiece in uh, 30 minutes that uh, is incredible. And then there's another group, and they're the salesmen, and they have something to sell. So I fall into the salesman category. So I've developed a, a unique way to fasten a cutting tool to a handle, and this clamping system right here for 10 bucks each, y'all can, uh, uh, and it's, but wait for tonight, tonight only, you can get two of these. And uh, so, oh, okay. So this is like a product release, and so patent is pending. And, uh, but this is, uh, in, in all honesty, this is how I've always, uh, I've never used some of the uh, other methods of attaching the, a gouge to a handle. This works good. So, anyway, you can see me after the demonstration and we'll take orders. Okay, uh, again, a lot of you have seen my work. Uh, I break, is in, the, the way I look at it, there's two kinds of wood that we wind up working with. And there's a lot of guys here that work with seasoned wood. We've seen some of that here. Uh, wood that uh, is kiln dried, et cetera, et cetera, so stability and things like that you don't have to worry about. Uh, then there's also the greenwood turners. And I fall into the greenwood uh, category. I try to get things on the lathe when they're dripping wet. Uh, and so what I... I uh, brought to the meeting, in fact, I'm going to give to the library. Is there anybody here that hadn't read Understanding Wood by Bruce Hosey or is not familiar with this? Okay, that's right. So Understanding Wood by Bruce Hosey. Again, this one, uh, a friend of mine gave it to me. I've had my own copy for some time. And Chapter 3 is something you really need to make a study of because it, it, lets, it gives you a real good foundation for how moisture and water vapor interacts with wood. And it affects everything we do, bar none. Uh, so, so check this out of the, of the library. Buy yourself a copy. Memorize chapter three if you can. You'll never regret it. So this is, this is worthwhile. Uh, another thing, and this is a, uh, uh, something that's free on the internet, which will, because we're all drying wood in one fashion or another, uh, on the Lignomat website, there's a paper by Gene Winger, so you just go to Lig Lignomat USA, and uh, go to uh, the papers, 
and it's on drying lumber. It's more about lumber than it is. He's, this guy's not a wood turner, and he heads up wood technology at uh, Virginia Tech. But uh, this is something, uh, there's a, a few pages in here that are absolutely golden on the drying techniques of wood, when it's going to check, when it's going to crack, how it's going to behave, and some of the nuances that very much affect what we do. So that's another source for you there. Okay. Uh, I've turned large pieces now for uh, a little over 10 years and, uh, and been happy doing so, but occasionally somebody would ask for a smaller piece. Um, and I'd be at a loss. So it occurred to me when going out on the lathe, I'd read an article and this, uh, there's an old turner and his name is Rude Asolnik. He died recently. But uh, Rude Asolnik, which is this fine woodworking, is about him. And this article in a April 1987, uh, he talked about weed pots and touting the, event, or the reasons for doing weed pots. So this is a, uh, it's a, it's an article if you can run into it. I can also uh, give this to the club for, the, for them to keep. And it's worth reading, it's, it's kind of a nice article. So, so after, I, I remembered reading that many, many, many years ago, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna start doing weed pots. Just, just for the fun, just to relax. Just in between these big pieces that take 45, 50 hours sometimes, uh, to be able to just go out in the shop, do a piece in 30 minutes, something like that. It's therapeutic. Where the big pieces are very tedious and uh, not particularly therapeutic. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so what I what I did is uh, uh, I wanted to do the weed pots, but to do weed pots, the, the technique that Rude Asolnik uses, Rude Asolnik is an expert spindle turner. And spindle turners are just, it's, they're their own class. They're probably the more talented wood turners we have. So I had to do something that was similar and that would let me use the same technique that I use on my big pieces. Because the way I look at it, doing a weed pot, and here's a good example of this is actually not a weed pot, this is a twig pot, because it's got a twig in it. And this is just a little piece of walnut. Uh, and see, you'll notice that there's a commonality in everything I do, and one is, there's always on the base, there's an inch and a half hole. Now that could be an inch and three, three quarters hole, or it could be an inch hole, whatever, but I happen to have an inch and a half Forstner bit, so therefore it's an inch and a half. And, uh, and, and you'll see a little, little spur drive pattern on there. It's typically a chamfered entry. And what I'll do is, instead of just putting a log on the lathe, I'll turn several blanks at one time. And, and so coming up in our neighborhood, we'll have 1st of May celebration. And, uh, you know, weed festival, if you will. So uh, it takes, uh, after you get it to this point, it's very easy to complete and uh, to do a weed pot. So what, I, what I'm gonna demonstrate is, first thing I'll demonstrate is I'll just take a, this is a piece of pecan right here, like any other piece of pecan. Um, it uh, just squared off at the edge. It's good to uh, cut these things is as uh, straight as you can, it makes it a little bit easier. Well, so I'm not, not accustomed to this particular lathe, so. There we go. So I'm just gonna, I should have a little pre-drilled dimple in it, but I don't. And I'm not sure what the travel of this thing is, but I'm going to 
Snug it up a little bit. Okay. So I guess we are set here. Is that right? Pull the red one. Okay, now, there's a, uh, one of the reasons, again, another reason I wanted to do the demonstration is because guys get up here doing demonstrations, and boy, they have this wonderful arsenal of tools. They bring this tool out and that tool out, and they're doing all this really cool stuff. I use one tool, and that's a bowl gouge. And if there's any one tool to use, it's a bowl gouge. Now, you could do it with an easy rougher if that's what you want to do. You could do it with a, uh, with a scraper if you wanted to do that. But I think if you're going to do bowls, and if you're going to try to get the techniques down to use those tools, use a bowl gouge. It's, uh, uh, it's a good use of, of your time to uh, figure out how to use these guys. I use, uh, I'm a uh, fan of the D-Way tool. This is just a standard, it's pretty much a standard grind. And on all my gouges, I use the same, same grind. This is a uh, 5 8 which is as big as they make. So what I want to do, now the, the objective, there's two objectives at this point. And one is, is to knock the edges off get it round. Of course, obviously, you want to round the whole thing. But create a tenon or a chuck, and I'm not going to go through that process. Putting in a chuck, drilling hole, you know, that's easy to do. But one of, a lot of guys, especially some that have not been used to dealing with just rough logs like this, uh, you don't have to have a bandsaw to do this. So we just uh, okay, get a little closer here. Make sure we're going to clear. Get this out of the way. And okay. Now, my normally when I'm putting something between centers. It weighs 300 pounds, so you'll see me doing a lot of tightening constantly. Uh, this is now, and let's see, am I, I need to be a little bit, that can be a disaster when it's a heavy piece, and you let it get a little bit away from you. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to, Round this guy out real quick. And uh, uh, the, the bowl gouge, like, uh, I, there's a lot of ways you can use it. Sometimes I'll use them in a very uh, uh, vertical position. But for doing roughing like this, I'll come as, uh, as horizontal as I can because that transfer, all, all the forces go directly into the tool west. And it's not that. Um, I'm 540 right now, and that's really fast for me. Uh, I have a uh, the big one-way machine, and I always leave it on the low range, and I rarely ever get above 300, sometimes 400 RPM. Of course, that's on big pieces. But uh, that's how I turn these as well. That's just, you know, that's, that's, and it's the way that I like to, uh, to cut is I like low, low speed. And so it's just that, uh, that straightforward. And then what I'll do is, by the way, if you have a lathe like this, one of the best things you can do 
is get some one inch or whatever the size of the post is. Get that, get a piece of PVC, cut it to length so you're not always adjusting the height. Just get it at one height and leave it there. I never have to adjust height. So then I always try to uh, square the face of it. And then do the same thing to the other side. Oh, what I want to do first here is it's a good, this is a good opportunity just to go ahead and make the tenon. So the second tool I'm using, and I, and I don't know if you'd have to, to do it this way, but I do have a parting tool that I use. Now, I don't use a parting tool for parting. In fact, I've just not. So now we have a uh, tenon to go into a chuck. And the reason it goes on a chuck, there's two operations. Uh, one is drilling the inch and a half hole. So you put it in a chuck, you put the, uh, uh, the drill chuck on this end, crank it down with one and a half inch uh, proportion, or you go in about an inch, that's all, and it gives you a nice release. And again, I, this is, the method in my madness is minimalism. Uh, the, the one tool is all you, all you really need. And we don't have to be pretty at this point. And then uh, put the tenon on the other end. Okay. And then if we want, I think when, when drilling, uh, and using the uh, large portion of bit, it's always a good idea to, uh, to have it on a flat surface if you can arrange it. So, uh, see if I can sneak in here and get this. Hello, go ahead. Okay. I'd normally make that cut from the other side. But anyway, at this point in time, you're ready to drill two holes. And in addition to drilling, so you drill the hole, um, as you see here, we can, and we can pass, pass this piece, and uh, this one I'm going to use, but we can pass this around. You drill a, uh, the one and a half inch Forstner, and you're done on this end. On this one, you drill a, a half inch, drill a five eighths, whatever you happen to have handy. Uh, if uh, uh, Trent Bosch came in a few years ago and taught us how to use a gun drill, that's what I use in this, but uh, just a regular old spade bit from Home Depot will be just fine. And then go ahead and chamfer it, because this may be the last chance you ever get to uh, do this in. So I'm going to pass this around so you can see. Oh, okay. Okay. So anyway, here is, uh, this one's ready for the hole. I'm not going to uh, take time uh, uh, or go through the tedium of uh, uh, dr drilling holes and everything and using a chuck and all, but I just happen to have a piece that is ready to roll. So it's got a hole, it's got the chamfer, it's got the one and a half inch hole. And the beauty to me, of uh, getting a, uh, let's see, I need to put the cone in this thing. Oh, 
which is not good. This whole thing wants to turn now. Is that a... But I know, but... It, but it, okay, so it's screwed on. I got no problem screwing it on. But if it snugs all the way down to where it wants to turn the whole thing. I mean, it's going to turn the whole... Oh, oh, the bearings on this side. It doesn't, doesn't work like a one-way. I told you I was new at this. Come on, guys. This, uh, give me a break. Uh, yeah. Okay. This operates... Okay. okay, and another, another nice, nice thing, thing is when, when the three-quarter drive is recessed in about an inch, and this is recessed in a good bit, the chances of this coming off and screwing up your dentures is less than it would be if you're working on the surface. So if, uh, if some idiot comes along and adjusts it a little too fast, then you don't have a problem. Or not as much of one, anyway. Okay. So we're going to make sure it turns all the way through. And so, again, we're going to try to make a simple gift for... And, and depending on how they come out, and, and there's a lot of examples. Uh, and so if we have somebody that can kind of pass those around, some of that is not finished. But the beauty of it is I can take a piece like this and a couple of these others, I can put them on the table at home, I can look at them over a period of days, and I'm thinking, you know what, it's a little fat or it doesn't, it's not quite uh, fair in this area right here. So I can put it back on the lathe and start turning it again. So, that, so you never turn away your ability to rework the thing. And to me, that's kind of fun because you keep refining it and get a, get, a, get a design you like. Okay, so this one is uh, there's 10 after 8, so let's just go with it. And uh, needless to say, this is out of balance which is where I'm most comfortable. Feel it shaking the lathe, but it won't be long. You know, a, uh, a particular uh, rounding, uh, if, you, if you're using, and, and again, on something like this, uh, I'm, I, I guess there's guys that would use a, what you call a roughing gouge, which is one of those big uh, circular things, and you use it like that, and uh, I've had one of those break on me, and that was, uh, I wasn't doing the smartest thing in the world, but I, anyway, it, uh, it broke on me. And which scared me to death, needless to say. So uh, I think the bowl gouge is the way to go. And and again, and is Jimmy Arledge? Well, he's probably 
hanging out in there, but uh, I'd I bought a new guide, and this was a lot of years ago when we had his old shop. And I had never seen anybody... round out a log until I saw Jimmy that day. Okay, let's stop and see what we got. Uh, we got a little bit of bark. We got a little bit of. Uh, this is going to be the top right here, and uh, we got a little bit of bark. So we got a little bit of natural design, if you will, uh, in the pieces that I just passed around, or on a piece like this. To me, a little bit of bark that makes it look nice. Makes it uh, gives it some character, and so whatever happens to be there. Um, just take it as uh, part of the design. So now, uh, now that it's round, then we can start getting serious about doing a, a shape. And when you're doing, when I do large pieces, shape is a big issue. And I, I totally believe that Somewhere deep in our DNA is a sense of design, and I don't care who you are. Uh, if you look at something and it's right, you know it's right. If you look at something and it's wrong, uh, it's uncomfortable. You may not know why it's wrong, but it just doesn't look, doesn't look good. So a piece like this, I don't know if this is really good or not, and if I, you put it next to a few other pieces and you look at it a couple of days and you think, you know what? Uh, I'm going to just whack it off right there and make uh, something a little different. Or I'm going to, uh, it looks kind of like an apple, I'm just going to cut it. You know, so you can do some things, you can still make them come out. But uh, uh, design is certainly a subjective issue. Um, and achieving a fair curve, and, and of course with the, with the big pieces that I do, it's all about fair curves. And I, I, there's a trick that I want to show you. Just take just a second here. And if I move like the mechanical man, that's because this wire's a little short, so I'm having, I want to turn my head too much. A uh, friend of mine gave me this. This is, a, this is a secret tool that I'm holding right here in front of you. Uh, this is the insert on a Honda windshield wiper. So there's some poor soul around here that has a one windshield wiper Honda. And uh, what, uh, take a look at an old lobster boat or an old, uh, any, kind of, any kind of old watercraft. And have you ever wondered, how did they get these beautiful lines on these boats way, way before there was computers. And the way they did it is there was a term in the boat building barn, and they called it lofting. And lofting is a process, and the loft was an empty room. It's uh, in, in most of the barns around here, you see a lot of hay in the loft. But uh, the, the lofting process is they would literally draw the boat on the floor. So they had to make a plan. And it may not have been a plan, uh, a, a detailed plan, but they, they, they knew where they were going. And the way they would do that is they would have, if it was going to be a 50-foot boat, they would have 50-foot battens. And a batten was a piece of wood, might be a half, a, a half of an inch thick, might be three-eighths of an inch thick very finely planed, and, and it was something that was cherished. And I mean, it was a key asset of the boat building operation. Because when you take a piece like this, 
and you give it a bend, it will always be a fair curve. No matter what you do with it, it's always going to be a fair curve. So you can put it against the pieces that you do, or you can put it against the pieces there. And you can, and again, this may be a little stiff for, for some of the smaller work there, but I can drape it over one of my pieces and take a close look under it. Oh, there's a little air. So that, that's a little too flat. That's where the curve softens a little bit where it should. So on either side, I know where I'm going to cut. So I can mark it with a pencil and go to work. So uh, achieving a fair curve is not as easy because you've got to remember, we're dealing in purely subtractive. Uh, where the pottery guys, they can add a little bit too if, they, uh, if something goes wrong. We don't have that option. We're taking it off and compensating. So anyway, uh, I would, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun thing to play with. But whether it's a, whether it's a windshield wiper insert, which this is, or uh, a strip of veneer, a strip of formica, you know, thin formica will work just as well. Okay, so I wanted to point that out because it took a while to figure that out. Okay, we'll crank the speed up just a little bit, and uh, now what I'm doing now is I'm trying to follow the, the bezel on the uh, on the gas. Now that was a bad cut. I didn't, uh, I didn't swing the gouge quickly enough. It, it flattened out the, uh, uh, the curve. So the next one, I need, to, I need to just come on in here. I don't need the tenons anymore. That the only person pur purpose, the only purpose of a tenon is to go in a chuck, and the only reason you go in a chuck is to drill some holes. After that, that that's the end of the chuck. I, I'm not a chuck user. I use uh, I use spur drives when I first start turning a piece. I don't care how big it is, and uh, I use uh, face plates. Uh, nothing of mine goes on chucks because I've, I've seen them, uh, seen pieces come out of them. Uh, so anyway, so I have kind of a marginal design going here. Now one of the advantages of having an inch and a half hole versus uh, uh, and not being in a chuck is right now I don't have a base. I just eliminated the base of this thing. And I don't know if you can see it uh, where it is, but it's, it's non-existent. It's a sharp edge right here. So to create a base, oh yeah, here it is right here. I can see, because I have a three quarter inch uh, spur drive and an inch and a half hole, I can just come in here make my base and then just sand out the little fuzz on the inside. So now I have a base. Uh, and you know what? I didn't even stick this into a chuck jaw. I don't know how many, how many of y'all have done that. Have you ever kind of run the tool into the old chuck? It's, uh, it's rude. Okay. So from this point on, it's just a matter of Crank 
it down. The uh, There goes our tenon on that side. Now, if you go on the internet and uh, Google Weed pot. Believe it or not, a lot of these things will pop up. And you'll see some that look like sake bottles. You'll see some that look like wine decanters that have a very big, uh, low base, so the decanter look is, is a good one. You'll see some that look like uh, perfume bottles. Uh, remember the old vinegar bottles that uh, you see every now and then that has, has a big base? You see them that look like that. And so there's a lot of uh, really kind of cool designs that are out there uh, that you can, if you see one that you like, then hey, try to do it. One thing I figured out trying to do this is that the um, I'm, more, I'm much more comfortable doing kind of a full cut like I'm doing right now. It just comes natural to me, and again, from the pieces that I work on. The doing a push cut is where you get your better cut, and especially when you get into, you kind of find yourself in a corner where you need to work in close quarters. A push cut may be all that's going to work for you, but finding the bezel and keeping in mind where the grain is going, but perfecting the push cut, I'm still having problems with that, uh, and and so to practice that, not only right-handed, but to practice it left-handed, uh, it is uh, I, I think is I think is a benefit. And once again, with these things, just steal a log off a neighbor's wood pile and go to work. It doesn't cost any money. Not that I would do such a thing. And now I will tell you one thing that doing uh, large pieces does is on large stuff and especially and especially on mistletoe burl mesquite where you have a lot of negative space. If you get into a habit of going fast and you see guys demonstrating and boy they just go ripping through it and Again, create a masterpiece. But if you're going fast on big stuff, and especially where there's a negative space, and uh, uh, Larry, you were talking about doing natural edge stuff. Now you got to be a little careful about going fast, <laughs> you know. And controlled, slow cuts. I don't know of anything that's really more difficult to, to do. And especially when you have a lot of air flying around, am I am I right? Uh, so this is a good place to practice that that kind of thing. And so to uh, uh, to press it too fast, If I try to go too fast here, it'll skip over. Pardon me? I just cut about two weeks ago, probably. Something like that. So it is, uh, in fact, that's a great segue to that book. Uh, wood is about, by weight, is 55% uh, water. So by weight, it, it, there's more water than there is fiber. And uh, uh, if you if you want to uh, think in terms of a sponge, and a sponge is a, is a really good analogy to uh, to a log. You can take a sponge that's just dripping 
absolutely dripping wet. And it's heavy. And you can squeeze it and get all that water out of it, but it's still damp. And you know what? The dimension of the sponge hasn't changed even a little bit. It's still the original uh, size that it was before you squeezed it. It's a lot lighter. But that condition is called a fiber saturation point, and that's when you've removed the free water, but the bound water is still in the cells. When the bound water that's in the cells starts drying, it starts shrinking. All right? Now, if you take a solid log and it starts drying on the, uh, obviously the outside is going to dry first, and it starts drying and it starts losing its bound water and the cells start drying out and they shrink, but they've got a core that's still intact, what's going to happen? It splits. You know, guess what, boys and girls, it, it splits every time. And uh, in, a, in a bowl or on nice work like you see right there, you don't want that. Now in a weed pot, I don't care. I try to stay under four inches, little splits. I'm, I'm not interested in it. I, it's for practice. It's for casual guests. So little splits on a weed pot. And if you go look at uh, Ruta Solnik stuff in here, he gets probably paid big bucks for one of his weed pots these days, if you can find one. Um, the, uh, the boys got some little, little splits on them. And you'll find uh, probably a few little, uh, yeah, you'll find a few little splits on this. It doesn't diminish it as a gift. Put a weed in it and it's good. So anyway. This is where I got to go slow. Now, so far, as, uh, as we're looking at this, that's a pretty ugly little weed pot. And so this is too thick. The uh, hole that I drilled is a uh, little less than, than 5 eighths, so we can go quite a bit smaller on that. Uh, you always want to cut downhill when you're dealing with a You're right, I'm not very good at left-handed. Let's come back here at the edge and just come on. Feel it chattering just a little bit. There we go. Uh, another way to look at weed pots is kind of like, if you, you know, if you, is there any uh, pianist out there? I don't care how accomplished they are. That before they play, they don't play a few scales. This is a good form of scales right here. So it's good. Uh, it's a good thing to uh, 
to just just kind of warm up with, uh, something to get your skills perfected with. But unlike scales, you do have a final product. Now I'm going to try more of a push cut right here. Which wasn't very good. Now, if I don't uh, have, uh, I, I don't do beads, but if there's spindle guys out here and they know how to do a bead where you're trying to bring this cut and this cut together, getting those just dead nuts on the money at a perfect, perfect curve, that is tough. So you can stick a bead in the middle and nobody knows the difference. They don't know if it's a little uneven. So that's, uh, that's a good, uh, that'd be a good thing to practice on. And if you don't get it quite even, Don't worry about it. Just give it to the neighbor that you like the least. So it's starting to chatter now. So it's uh, we got a yeah. You can see uh, the. Uh, it starts whipping a little bit, and you can see the, the whip marks. So to take care of that, I'm going to turn a little bit faster. And uh, I probably need to lower this thing down. Uh, does anybody here use James Johnson tool refs? Anybody? Anybody use James Johnson? Oh. Yeah. Now, 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 it makes sense that you'd be the guy using a James Johnson. But if, if you get used to a James Johnson, it spoils you for everything else because you're a little bit more vertical this way, so you have better protection from your hands. And with this thing, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, it's going to get me here in a minute. And uh, which on something like this is no big deal. Pardon me? Yeah, James Johnson doesn't have the stainless. Yep, yep, yeah. Let's see if I can get that little bit of chatter out of it. I think we came close. You see any? I don't see any. Got her done. Um, so we could, you know, with a piece like this, we can play with it for a while. Uh, and again, a lot of these things, I like to uh, come back uh, the next. Uh, the next day and and try to do a little bit uh, more one of the more difficult uh, uh, cuts and again something to practice is go slow 
is how to make a slow cut, a very, very controlled, and sometimes, especially when it's a little bit on the rough side, to be able to press it down into the tool rest, put a, put a lot of pressure just straight down to keep it from uh, following the wood too much, especially if you've got uh, uh, some, some chatter or something like that. But the ability to go slow, it's easy to go fast. But uh, I, would, I would encourage you to do that. And another thing that is, um, uh, again, doing big pieces, you wouldn't think that you're constantly taking off maybe thousandths, what I think is sometimes not more than a thousandth of an inch. But you can long after the wire and the battens and all that start showing problem spots. Uh, you'll see it, you'll feel it, you can see it if you look closely enough. But one of the problems that I have is that when you put the finish that I put on my, my work, um, if you see light reflecting like these straight fluorescent bulbs, if you're looking at a piece and it takes a kind of an unpleasant curve as you're looking at it against a, uh, the a rail on a door, uh, on a doorway, a fluorescent light, whatever, or, or a window, when it does something funny, all of a sudden the piece doesn't look good. And so to see that, to feel that, and you can feel it with your hand before you can, uh, in the final analysis, you can feel more with your hand than you'll ever see with your eyes. And that's, that's kind of hard to uh, maybe to accept, but that's, that be the truth. But anyway, so to take, a, uh, uh, to take a piece like this, and I'll come in and, and I'll just keep nuancing the, a little nicer there. And uh, this is always the most difficult part on one of these. Right at the juncture between the stem and uh, the large part. But it's looking a little bit better. And there's probably special tools or there's scrapers or things like that that would get you out of that, uh, uh, that would make that cut maybe perhaps a little bit easier. But I will tell you this, if you learn to do it with the bowl gouge, that's a, that's a skill that you'll be glad that you have. I, I just, um, and it, to do it, uh, the bowl gouge, I, I'm, I've never used it. the easy tools. I have no idea, uh, you know, what their real purpose is. But I can tell you that uh, I don't think they'll do what the, what the bowl gouge will. And a favorite tool of mine is, this is a 5 8 inch gouge, and I've probably used it way too long. The, uh, uh, the 3 8 gouge is, uh, is my go-to tool. And so I don't care whether my piece is 22 inches in diameter. Uh, and in incidentally, uh, Ken, you remember that log that pictures you sent out about three weeks ago? Well, that, that was that mistletoe burl that I was showing you all. Uh, back at the restaurant, and uh, uh, for the cuts that I'll be making on it after I get it rounded and after I get it going, and, it's, and the final cut will be with a 3 8 inch gouge. Uh, because when you think about it, if you're taking small shavings, if you're doing really fine work, a big gouge doesn't help you a bit. In fact, it, uh, if, and if it has a heavy feel to it, it may get in your way. So I, I, like, the, uh, I like the little stuff. And uh, yeah, 
I rounded it a little bit. So I could I could go on all night and try to uh, fine tune the uh, and get the tool marks out, but I think you know what I want to do is give y'all an idea of what was what I was doing. And right now I'll do one more time. I'll just cut a little bit better base. Since I took my So with a little bit more fussing, that could be a reasonable, yeah, and if it, uh, as you'll see, it's cracked a little bit right here. This is green wood, and so I make no bones about it. It's got a small hole in it. It's going to crack. Uh, it's, it's a weed pot. Uh, because, one, I like to have a big relief in the bottom. That's just the way I... Uh, I mean, you don't have to. You could have a shallow hole. But, but what this allows me to do is, if I'm on this, and if I'm just working to the... Uh, you know, to the drive, and I don't know how to, how to put this right, but... The way that, and the way Ruta Solnik does it is he starts with a longer log and he makes it, makes his forms and everything, and then he uses a parting tool. And, uh, and, and, and spindle turners, and you see them do that all the time, uh, and you see some old guys do it, but mostly the spindle guys, uh, you'll, they'll, they'll come in, they'll part it with a tool uh, like, uh, like this, or wherever some of them are much thinner. You part it, you catch it. Well, you try to catch some of the stuff that I do, and you're going to be in pretty sad shape. Uh, you don't catch. I don't, I, don't, I don't do parting and catching. And so what I do, if I do the inch and a half uh, Forstner bottom, it gives a base to it. It gives, I can, if I uh, get a little bit out of control up here and I need to shorten it a little bit to make it more rounded, I can, I can do that and come back and make a flat. Because I like something to sit on a flat, uh, but you don't have to. You can do a, just a shallow indention. Obviously, you want to have a flat surface for it to sit on a surface. Uh, it would have happened. I don't, I'm not. I'm not sure. It, it uh, um, there's an. Yeah. The bot. The bottom might not have been. I don't know. But uh, yeah, the Forster bit. Pretty. Pretty flat. Yeah. No, no. On, on the top of the weed pot, you can use a, you can use a Home Depot spade bit if you want to. You can use a twist bit. Um, on this, I use a gun drill. Uh, Randy made some uh, uh, gun drills for me. Have y'all y'all ever seen gun drills used? Uh, you can find them on the internet, and they're <laughs> kind of fun to use. But, you know, they're long, so you get a long bit, and on the end is, is carbide, and they're hollow. And what they do is when you're making a gun barrel, and I don't care whether you're making uh, a pellet gun or you're making a 12-incher uh, uh, a for a ship, it's all done the same way. There's oil that's forced through in these things you know, on a big, huge lathe and uh, turn very slowly, and the shavings come out because the oil is coming through. You don't start and stop like they do a wood bit. You, Drill so if you, on a uh, deer rifle or something like that, drill it all at one time, one pass, and uh, uh, and so these gun drills, five five five, and uh, so you figure out a way to get it on a uh, compressed air with a uh, ball valve and and with a handle on it because you need to be able to hold on to the silly thing, and and with it. In a chuck, 
on a lathe, uh, what I'll do is uh, I have a small one, and I'll start, and I'll go right through the uh, uh, tailstock. With I'll take this off, so I have a clear hole, and, I, and I'll go in five, six, seven, eight inches, and uh, with the air blowing the stuff out, and then I may go in with the bigger uh, gun drill. But again, that's that's equipment you don't have to have a spade bit for what two bucks at uh, Home Depot will work just as good. Uh, a hole is a hole. And then I like to chamfer it a little bit because I haven't found, uh, uh, I like to go ahead and just use the point, a pointed uh, 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 drive or whatever. And uh, uh, so I'll, I'll, use, I'll use that. And if I, you know, so I can still work Bring it down in diameter without running into the uh, into it with my gouge. So. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah, might have. Well, yeah, it's the bottom. And like I say, and, and if it, and it really kind of comes out crummy, give it to a neighbor you really don't like. <laughs> I drilled this one uh, probably down here, and not because it has to be, but because I could. Uh, you know, I, I, got, I just started doing it. Yeah, yeah, it's not that long. Yeah. It, it needs to be deep enough to do that. So now, if it were a little higher and that were sitting up there, that's still not going to knock it over, right? I think we're safe. And uh, so, so it, it doesn't have to be deep. But one, one of the things about uh, uh, when I was first doing this, and, and again, you know, this is such a simple, uh, you know, it's a really, really simple little uh, item here, but it's astonishing how many dumb mistakes you can make when you're trying to figure out how to do it. And uh, uh, if, if you look at, at Ruta Solnik, who's one of the great masters, what he did is he would uh, finish them. This would be solid. And then he would go to a drill press and, you know, right on down. Well, I tried doing that. It was on a piece of mesquite. Man, that thing got away from me, and I was uh, trying to turn off drill press and grab it at the same time. And uh, I lost a little blood on it, and, and which added character to the piece. You know, and uh, so, so then I could cut it off, and there was a little bit of red flowing around, and it was kind of cool, you know. So, uh, and there's... But uh, seriously enough, uh, but when you're when you're doing that drilling, and drilling's kind of a, a brutal, uh, you know, thing. You're just really ram this thing in. So to have it on the on the chuck, and to have it at full diameter like this, you're not going to break anything. You're not going to. Nothing's going to come apart. When it gets slim and all that kind of stuff, and especially if you get uh, one like this, and there's not a huge amount of, of wall thickness between the hole and uh, and this, so 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 this is uh, it, let, it allows it to be a you know a nice graceful little piece. I would uh, uh, if you elect to do these things, and especially uh, with the uh, maples or hackberries or whatever wood you want to use, I would recommend you not try to finish them. And I'd uh, also recommend is try to use the gouge where you get a nice, clean cut because sanding isn't all that much fun on on uh, really wet green wood. So uh, uh, just uh, perfect the tools, keep them sharp, get, uh, ride the bevels where you're having really nice, graceful curves. And after, after a while, you get to where they're really kind of fun. 
And if you have a um, uh, so, some of the blanks, like like we passed around, have a few of those around the shop, you can do one in 20, 30 minutes. So it's not like it's, it's a commitment, uh, you know, as far as time. Okay, any other? No, but I would. I, uh, uh, I am, uh, I haven't been accused of being too smart to do something like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I got to tell you that uh, occasionally I run into a nail on a big piece, and when uh, somebody drives up, I ran into, would you believe, an old 16 penny nail? But it was a 16 penny nail that had a kind of a square shaft, so it was a hand forged nail. And it was on a, a walnut log that uh, was, you know, 20 some odd inches in diameter, and I was hollow. So when you run into them on the outside, it's not such a big deal. You can kind of go after it and pull it out with a, and everything and get to it. But when you're on the inside, it is tough. And, uh, uh, and I've run into uh, uh, lead, lead balls, so you find those stuck in trees. And, and of course, a, uh, uh, some of these walnut logs, if you look at the annular rings, they're 100 years old, right? So, so somebody hits it with a bullet way back when, and there you are turning it. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. But yeah, nails are a bummer. Any other questions? Hey, go make a weed pod. Ha, 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 ha.